All right, we're heat. Okay, well, welcome folks um, to the Spatial Decision Support Consortium uh, webinar that we're holding here on June 1st, 2023. Um, my name is Sean Gordon. I'm the current president of the uh, Spatial Decision Support Consortium. And with me here, we have a, a number of members of the board of the consortium. Uh, we'll introduce a few of them as we go along here. Uh, first, I guess I wanted to say a, just a, a few things a, about the consortium. Here we're looking at the uh, website homepage. Um, we're really a network of folks that is are interested in spatial decision support techniques. Um, we originally got together many years ago uh, under a project uh, with the University of Redlands, where we were putting together an ontology for uh, spatial decision support. And the idea there was to come up with a common set of terms uh, in spatial decision support that, and there the relationship between those terms that would let us um, better index information and find information related to spatial decision support and and hopefully um, make interoperability between different uh, decision support technologies easier to implement. Um, we're still working on that. It's one of the core functions of the network here. Um, you can see we've got a few different work groups. One of them is um, working on the ontology. We've also done a number of uh, case studies on the use of decision support. Um, we've got spatial decision support uh, sustainability working group that was working on um, terminology uh, specifically related to, to uh, sustainability and also a working group on workflow engines. So if folks are interested in any of those, uh, we'd encourage you to uh, review the web page there and, and um, express your interest to the group. Um, if you're not a member of the consortium right now, I want to pass it over to uh, Patrick Huber, uh, our membership coordinator, and he will tell you about how to join. Thanks, Sean. Hi, everyone. I'm Patrick Huber. I'm a researcher at University of California, Davis. I've been on the board for a little over a year now and am filling the role of the membership coordinator. Um, if you're not currently a member, but what you see here looks interesting and you'd like to join, I'm putting a web address in the chat and uh, access to that and uh, please join us. All right, uh, back over to you, Sean. Thanks, Patrick. Well, we'll get going with the, the main event today and um, have another board member here, Philip Murphy, to introduce our first speaker. Okay, thanks, uh, Sean. Uh, yeah, I, my name is Philip Murphy. I'm a, uh, I'm a small software company up here in uh, Seattle. Um, I, I'm, I'm uh, currently the secretary of the board, uh, just like Patrick, been in that for the last year. Um, my background is I'm, I'm a physicist uh, who, um, by accident, ended up working in Japan on AI back in the early 90s, where I got really interested in, in uh, decision making um, and decision making support. But when you've got a, um, and the things that make them hard, like when you've got a bunch of different uh, competing objectives and you're trying to figure out what's the best alternative, and um, also, um, around uncertainty, uncertainty because maybe you don't have all the information you want, or maybe there are irreducible uncertainties like climate change where there are multiple future scenarios and you're not sure which way you're going to go down. How do you make decisions in, in the middle of all that? And then since I was working in a second language, really got interested in the whole concept of language uh, as a voter barrier, as a media, as a barrier to decision support. How do you communicate across different, um, different languages that are actually different languages? But also when you're dealing with different sectors, uh, how do you find a, a way of defining words uh, that are clear and 
you can communicate to the others. So that really got me into ontologies, which is sort of that first project that uh, Sean alluded to uh, down at, at Redlands, where we started working on the Spatial Decision Board ontology with people from different uh, backgrounds. Um, turns out we all had different ideas about the same words. So um, working on this stuff is what keeps me up at night. And, uh, and one day uh, when I was working in my office here in Seattle, uh, some guy showed up at my door and uh, said, hey, we've been using your software alongside a thing called the Ecosystem Management Decision Support System or EMDS. Uh, we're interested in integrating it, do you wanna do it? And that was Keith Reynolds, our, our speaker today, whose topic is really interesting and covers a lot of the stuff about uncertainties and scenarios. I've always been interested in it. The, top, the, the, the uh, topic is called Lake Tahoe West, a forest landscape resilience assessment for the 21st century. And uh, Keats um, is a senior uh, uh, research um, uh, forester at the, uh, the, at the Forest Service. Um, but he's also, um, way back in the early 90s, um, uh, he also came up with a really stupid idea, which was to um, think about how could you use something like fuzzy logic in, uh, when making decisions around uh, natural resources, and particularly forests. So that's how EMDS came into existence. And, most of all, Keats' insight that I think has really stood at uh, time was that, you know, the scientists that have the idea about how the, how the universe works and how to interpret it and how you want to think about it. So you really want them to be creating the models, not a bunch of coders who don't really understand uh, the domain area. So the EMDS, which is his baby, um, uh, has this unusual thing that it has tools like uh, NetWeaver, which does fuzzy logic, or my tools that does multi criteria decision support. Uh, or a rule system called VisiRule, or a Bayesian modeling system um, you know, called Gini, that um, these are systems in which scientists can actually build the models and then execute them in a spatial environment. Um, and so this, this really got all of my interest and introduced the concept of spatial uh, decision making, which again was part of how I got sucked into all of this uh, spatial decision support stuff. Um, and so he's, um, uh, uh, Keith's going to um, walk us through a really interesting uh, tricky decision process uh, around Lake Tahoe West and, and how these tools have given us a new way to look at on, uh, introducing uncertainty into decision-making for long-term planning. Okay, uh, Keith, I hope I haven't messed up your presentation too much, but um, take it away. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Philip. Um, let's see. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, so let me uh, launch this puppy. Oh, there we go. All right, so uh, again, my name is Keith Reynolds. I'm a research forester with the Forest Service Research in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, my name is the only one up here uh, for this presentation, but in reality, there were probably at least 25 people behind this whole thing. And I didn't want to give you a list of 25 names to stare at, and that's not very helpful. But I can tell you just briefly, this involved local and regional planning organizations around Lake Tahoe, as well as US Forest Service, National Forest System and Forest Service Research in the Northwest and South in, uh, region, uh, California region, and uh, a handful of uh, researchers from the, the sundry universities in, in California. The topic is uh, Lake Tahoe West, which is looking at a forest landscape resilience assessment for the 21st century. Uh, here really quickly is to orient you, I guess most people know where California is, but uh, Lake Tahoe resides on the border between California and Nevada, and that's what you're seeing here. The, uh, the black outline is the whole entire basin, and Lake Tahoe West is the purple area that you see on the west side of the Lake Tahoe. Uh, so I'm going to quickly and briefly go through the, this is the design process and methods and basically cut to the chase with the results. But here's, first of all, an, an overview of the decision support process. The basic objective here was to evaluate five alternative management strategies for maintaining forest ecosystem resilience in the Lake Tahoe West region uh, over the 21st century. And there's two major components to this uh, analysis. Uh, the first was the land, land is to landscape simulator, which basically simulates system dynamics, in this case under climate change. And uh, 
then the other major piece of this was the, for, the decision ecosystem management decision support system, which I've been developing for about the last 30 years. Uh, we're using a combination of the capabilities of EMBS in this, in this application. The first is logic processing to interpret and synthesize information to uh, infer the state of ecosystem resilience. Uh, that then uses is passing information to a multi-criteria decision model, which is uh, from Philips company, InfoHarvest, that's Criterion Decision Plus. And another thing that was uh, very heavily used in this particular application was automated workflows, which I'll talk a little bit about why that was in a minute. But uh, first of all, uh, so these are the treatment scenarios that this project was looking at. Uh, and I'll go just quickly through them. You can read the descriptions over here for more detail, but basically it looked at five. Fire suppression only, which was the minimalist strategy. Uh, thinning within the wildland urban interface, which is a small chunk of the area. A more extensive thinning approach uh, in the larger surrounding region. And then Did I freeze? Uh, oops. Oh, that's good. Don't need that. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Uh, okay. Quickly, the land is simulation stuff. Uh, again, it dealt with the five management scenarios that you saw in the last slide. Uh -oh. uh, hopefully, that's not a big problem. Um, let's see. It. Uh, <sighs> Cancel. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, oh, come on, go away. Uh, tell. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Okay. Uh, it dealt with uh, an intermediate climate change projection, which came from the IPC, IPCC, and it basically output summarized information about the Lake Tahoe West landscape at 10 year intervals over the 20, course of the 21st century. Uh, a number of the uh, uh, Landis outputs were used in subsequent analyses, and uh, one a good example of that is uh, Landis has fire models built into it, and the fire outputs were fed to subsequent models that were tracking uh, smoke plumes uh, over uh, as forest fires occurred in the simulations. Um, okay, now the EMDS logic modeling is sort of the first major EMDS piece. Uh, this is taking the Landis outputs and again, interprets and synthesizes them in a logic-based model. There are eight overarching topics that we'll look at in a minute, and these are fed to eventually the decision model, which comes next. Uh, there were several many, several to many inputs per logic topic. Uh, these were evaluated for each of the five scenarios at each of 10 time steps over the 21st century. Now, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, why we're using uh, automated workflows, there were uh, literally several thousand records, each of which had hundreds of fields, and it was a massive amount of data. So the EMDS, the logic modeling part, was used to distill all that massive amount of information down to essentially 400 sets of inputs that fed the decision model step. And in terms of the logic topics, you can see those here. Uh, we fire risk and risk in the surrounding environment too, air quality, recreation, et cetera. You can look at that list there. Just these are the main outputs that were processed in the logic modeling phase. This is the decision model. Again, this is a Phillips CDP model. Uh, what you see here, well, first of all, the overall goal here was to evaluate the performance of these five scenarios with respect to supporting ecosystem resilience. Uh, the overall goal of this thing is to evaluate the scenarios and their performance with respect to uh, supporting uh, ecosystem resilience. It's uh, broken down into three primary decision criteria, community values, environmental quality, and operations. And for each of these, you can see they're broken out into sub, uh, subtopics. And over on the extreme right side of this figure, uh, you'll see that there are 16 inputs here. The ones that are uh, flagged with a red dot are these are the uh, 
outputs that come from the logic modeling. So there's a, there's been a lot of interpretation synthesis to distill that down to these eight basic inputs. And then there's uh, eight more in here that come from other sources. So some of the data comes directly from the NetWeaver processing. Some of it comes directly from databases. But uh, just, to review, just to summarize, there are three primary decision criteria, a total of 16 attributes, eight attributes from logic model, and eight attributes from other sources. Now, the, uh, I'm going to cut to the chase here because the time frame is short. Um, so the basic idea here was to evaluate performance outcomes in terms of resilience in Lake Tahoe. Uh, we didn't need to do this, but just to, to facilitate user understanding of the outputs, uh, the decision model scores range from zero to one, where a score indicates uh, desired conditions for maintaining resilience are fully satisfied. And the grading system goes from uh, A to F. And you'll see in the, in the uh, graphs that come up, they're sort of broken out in the same way, where in this range, you're looking at excellent, good, intermediate, and so on. And that was, again, uh, the metrics themselves are continuous, but we've sort of used a grading system to improve the uh, display of the maps, or the outputs, rather. So here's the first one. This is looking at performance of community values. Again, this is over the entire span of the century. Uh, some things to note here. Uh, the extensive use of prescribed fire, which is S5, that's the blue line, definitely performs best at least over the first 70 years. There's a major uh, event at year 90, a catastrophic fire, where things kind of go to heck in a handbasket, but we'll come back to that later. Uh, extensive thinning, which is S3, the green line, or prescribed fire, S4, the uh, purple line, they performed well through the, through the period. And then there was, in, in contrast, there was pretty high variability over the 100 years with respect to uh, using fire suppression only or the buoy thinning scenario only. And that's those are the, uh, let's see, yellow and red orange lines. So that's one of the components. Here's the next one. This is the performance of environmental quality. And this is an interesting story in some respects. Extensive use of prescribed fire, that's the blue line again, clearly outperforms everybody else over the 100 year period. And all scenarios with the other four kind of bunched together down here are basically sort of falling roughly in the in the good range over the over the hundred year period, but they all perform pretty similarly by co compared to the uh, results for extensive prescribed fire. And then <clears throat> here's the look at performance of management operations over the period. Uh, management costs are main, main, management operations mainly reflect costs and the performance of suppression was consistently the highest because it's the cheapest thing that one could possibly do. But it's, as you saw earlier, it's not, not that effective in some other respects. Uh, the we prescribed fire, which was again S4, was effective and close to second compared to the first one. And then by contrast, extensive thinning and extensive prescribed fire are relatively expensive. So they perform kind of on the lower end of the range here. But now if we put everything together, <clears throat> Here's the overall performance when we combine all three of those criteria. The, there's uh, extensive prescribed burning, uh, which is again, the blue line, uh, is almost always a top performing scenario <clears throat> in this model. The uh, extensive thinning and we prescribed fire perform uh, about the same and marginally better than suppression only and uh, we thinning only. And then uh, come back to that. 90 year, this was a catastrophic fire uh, was simulated at year 90, which is sort of kind of a leveler. Everybody sort of looks kind of the same at that point. But the important thing to note here is after year 90, the whole system begins to bounce back again. And presumably if, we, if this was tracked out over several more decades, you would see the system uh, recovering until there was perhaps another major catastrophic event. So that is the, the quick and dirty version of this. Again, uh, Thank you for listening. Uh, got my contact info here. If anyone would like to uh, follow up with everything, anything you've just seen, and be happy to answer a few questions as there's time. And I'll stop sharing. 
So anybody Sorry. got some hot questions? Of course I do. So if you don't start asking questions, I'll start asking questions. Uh, <laughs> thanks. I have a question. Can you tell us more about, uh, so the, the net of all of those um, models and sub models is your definition of resilience? I mean, well, the, uh, I guess I, I should have mentioned that. Uh, the way we think about resilience here is uh, when the model is run at a point in time, what it's really looking at is the state of the system, which is really sort of basically ecosystem integrity. Now, where you get to resilience is the uh, dynamic behavior of, of integrity over that time period. So the, 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 the inference about integrity sorry, uh, uh, resilience sort of follows from the dynamics, the, the temporal dynamics of, of integrity over the time period. That's a good way to think about it because classically integrity is about system, system state and resilience is about system function. And so the performance, the trajectory over time kind of gives you some inference about how well you're doing resilience wise. It's not an explicit treatment of resilience though. That's a good question. So Keith, um, uh, the you mentioned that Lambda's um, uh, had fire, and are you using some sort of like um, probability just fire probability ignition distribution or something? How, yeah. how did a fire suddenly erupt in ninety years out? <laughs> well, the uh, I, I could have pointed out more about the fire stuff in the trajectories, but I won't go back there. Uh, but briefly, the uh, Landis is st stochastically simulating fire events. And they are, if you looked at some of the lines wiggling up and down over the 90 years, or over the 100 year period, uh, a lot of that is due to moderate to slightly major uh, forest fire occurrences. The, uh, the one that happened to occur at year 90 was catastrophic. And that's why you saw things kind of go to heck in a handbasket. <laughs> but it is, it's handled stochastically. And, but there was just one, um... mm -hmm one run of Landis done? Like there wasn't multiple stochastic no, were, runs done? No, uh, the, all the Landis outputs were based upon um, 10 replicates. Mm. So it's uh, for every single year that it's running, it generates uh, 10 replicate outputs. And then those get summarized, uh, actually, well, they're sampled at 10 year intervals. Uh, so the, the, at the 10 year points, those are not like a summary of the whole last 10 years. They are, this is where we are 10 years or 20 years out into the future with the current state of the system. Well, sort of getting back to uh, Jordan's question of resilience, it's sort of, it'd be really interesting to see if you'd followed out after that catastrophic fire for another, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, under which scenario does do the uh, uh, in the indicators come back quicker? Uh, you know, well, actually, as you, I, I mean, we, went, we went we went through that rather quickly, but everything started bouncing back in in year one hundred. So every all the all the five all the five strategic alternatives were behaving somewhat similarly in that respect. And I suspect if you track tr uh, spread this out for another fifty or hundred years, you would see pretty much the same performance that you saw in the first hundred being replicated. until the next major fire. How does the management agency, whoever's the authority for that, the West region, how do they use this? They, they, it informs what they're doing in terms of a budget or a management plan for on the ground action for the next year or two, and then you rerun the scenarios with them or what happens? Uh, well, the, um, <clears throat> it's a really, that's another really good question. Um, Basically, the, the five strategies are an attempt to sort of pin the corners on the possible strategies that you could use. So basically, the managers are, are taking these five distinct strategies and, and considering sort of mixing and matching them to, to uh, generate improvements. So we're not trying to, there isn't an, this is not an optimization solution. So. If you think about pinning the corners, there's five of those, but uh, you could imagine sort of mixing and matching some of these things to accomplish some uh, you know, better overall longer term objectives for the management agencies. 
And would the mix and match be about, you know, micro climates, micro regions, or just what makes sense that year in in conditions and budget, or how, you know, how do they get to that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a planner, so I'm not sure that I can uh, uh, shed a whole lot of light on that one. But um, you think this where uh, portfolios would be really useful. Ah, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's another one of our tools in the in the in the toolbox of EMDS. Philip has added some very cool new technology that basically looks at uh, putting out treatments on landscapes. Oh, by the way, this is. So this is this was really strategic. We had one spatial observation, which was the, the uh, Lake Tahoe West landscape. We didn't. There was no spatial analysis here. We substituted temporal. So uh, we're actually summarizing uh, all the information about the entire state of the system on the landscape at a particular point in time, and then running that over this hundred-year time period with the 10, 10 iterations of the Landis model. And, getting that summarized and sending it to the uh, uh, logic models. Okay, time 30. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I think with the, perfect. perhaps we'll wrap this up now and uh, move over to the second presentation. And, um, you know, if folks have some time at the end, can certainly come back at Keith with some more questions. And also if uh, folks are have time and interest, uh, you know, discussing the Spatial Decision Consortium itself at the end, uh, I think a couple of us would be happy to uh, stay on and 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 have have any discussion, uh, you know, about the future of the consortium too. So I will pass it over now to Shinwei who is our president-elect and um, worked with our second speaker on, on the project uh, that we'll be hearing about next. Uh, ahead, thank Shinway. you. Hi, thank you, Sean. Can you hear me? Uh, Can. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon from College Station, uh, Texas. I I'm the president-elect of this uh, consortium. I'm also a professor of urban planning uh, geography and multidisciplinary engineering at the Texas e and College Station. Uh, here's our next speaker is my PhD student, uh, Jiaxing Du. Uh, it's a joint work uh, between us and uh, uh, UCGIS, uh, Diana and uh, Karen Kemp, uh, and there's other computer science uh, faculty from uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. So we work for, together building a GIS knowledge graph. Uh, Jiaxin currently is a, will be the fourth year PhD student. His research expertise is on large language model, uh, GIS science and urban thematics. Without further ado, Jiaxin, it's back to you. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jiaxin Du and uh, today the title of my speech Big is Jazz KG building a large scale hierarchical knowledge graph for geographic information science. Uh, this work is published in IDGS uh, almost two years ago now. So, uh, why we have this research? What's the benefits for building this Jazz knowledge graph? At first, uh, for any research community, we need a common language. So, um, and the community should have a like, core of knowledge and they should evolve organically. And uh, so the, and the community like researchers can have like common concepts and they're cooperating around those concepts. And also such knowledge graph uh, enable the maintenance and expansion of the knowledge base in a dynamic, interactive and uh, collaborative fashion. The knowledge graph also ideally can provide a platform for research collaboration, teaching, and uh, workforce development. So those are the goal or benefits uh, Knowledge Graph can provide. So um, the overall research question for this one would be, uh, can we create a comprehensive Knowledge Graph for all those both benefits and goals we mentioned? And 
one observation in the JS field is there are multiple knowledge graphs already exist there. So I uh, here have a table with five different sources of the knowledge graph. Uh, first one is the JS science and technology body of knowledge created by university consortium of jazz science and uh, it has content like knowledge areas units topics learning objectives narratives those are their like hierarchical structures of how they organize those contents and uh, this is the date when we assess them and also there are other body of knowledge like the essential body of knowledge created by U.S. Geospatial Intelligence Foundation, the Geospatial Technology Computation Model uh, created by Geotech Center, and Geospatial uh, Management Competency Model created by Urban and Regional Information System Association. So for all those different um, body of knowledge, they are in various content, they are in different uh, structures, but one thing special about those knowledge graph is they all share one learning objective and learning objective in all the uh, different knowledge graphs. Part of the history reason is all those four bottom four rows of knowledge graph are derived from the GST body of knowledge. But uh, when they are like, separated from the root, they added um, or edited something so it becomes more uh, different than the original source, but they also add lots of new knowledge to it. So then we have the question, can we merge all those knowledge graphs together to create a more comprehensive knowledge graph to support the research? So one example, like one real example of the knowledge graph is the hierarchical structure. For example, on the root, it has the knowledge area called analytics modeling. And you can see the part of it, um, we can have analytics of errors and uncertainty. It's part of the modeling process. And the mathematical models is one way to derive the uncertainty in a wonderful DOM. And also we have the learning objective like compute descriptive statistics and the geostatistics of geographic area. Um, it's part of the goal for the mathematical model of uncertainty. So with this, it's kind of one example of the hierarchical structure in the um, knowledge graphs. So the whole workflow of this research will be looked at this one. So first, we want to build a unified ontology for JS by merging all those separated bodies of knowledge together with this hierarchical ontology. Second step is, uh, besides those backbones, we want to add more content. We want to add flash and meat to this backbone. Um, so research papers, articles, Wikipedia pages, they can be more descriptive information for those uh, backbone ontology. And also those Wikipedia research papers have their own citation relationship. They have uh, many other relationship, combine them together. So ideally we can have all the um, knowledge materials attached to the hierarchical ontology. So this is the goal for the JSKG JS graph. Then using this knowledge graph, we can build applications like we can visualize it so everyone can access and see how those knowledge graph looks like. And then we can build applications such as uh, research paper retrieval system. And we can evaluate how those systems doing with uh, different metrics. So how we merge those knowledge graphs? Uh, for the different knowledge graphs, they have um, different items. Items like we just mentioned the uncertainty, it's part of the um, modeling level. And we have like conceptual data models. We have 3D representation. All those are some like learning points um, from those knowledge graphs. And we just put a bunch of them together and we can measure are those um, source items have some overlaps. For example, the conceptual data models may have some overlap with the conceptual database models. It also have overlap with logical database models. So after we found those like overlapping map uh, items, 
we can uh, ignore or edit them. So merging them together, then those uh, overlap concepts can forge into one uh, item. So we don't have many duplicate items in the hierarchical knowledge graph. And also uh, some sources have unique items. For example, the JS body of knowledge don't have the 3D representation. Then we can add this item to our final product. Then we kind of solving all those um, knowledge graph together. So uh, we add it to the new knowledge graph. For the relations ranking, we have uh, actually more uh, complex system uh, rather than just compare the words. So we'll, we call it ERT ontology, ERT and paper ERT. Ontology ERT is one source item. It ha also have the hierarchical structure because when we have the uh, mathematical model of uncertainty, we also have the um, learning objective. We have the um, topper level. We have the level uh, on top of it, we have the level uh, below it, and all those uh, items that are linked with the original knowledge graph form this ERT by like, just combining them together, and we have um, embedded method. So the upper and lower level of the ontology can be forged into one, and all the information can be embedded into one um, source item. And we have those traditional language model embedding methods like TF-IDF. We have uh, word vectors. We have language models to combine those uh, semantic meanings together. And for paper ERT, similarly, it's, it's, not, it's not only the title and the abstract of the original paper. It also links with the citation information. Then we know what this paper is really like, put it into the context and we have um, also different language models to embed all the semantic meaning together. Then we measure those similarities and then we can have this um, research papers, Wikipedia mapped to the hierarchical ontology. So after we got this like just body of uh, just knowledge graph, we have uh, several experiments on how this um, knowledge graph can help us do other things. So first here is an example of information retrieval task. The information retrieval task is um, we have uh, re, uh, models like you can retrieve research papers from Grove Scholar. You can have research papers just uh, based on some very traditional search system. So we compare the re, uh, experiment with using this ontology, uh, using this JS knowledge graph or not, and not using this JS knowledge graph. So um, for the uh, different experiments, first line is the original search system and plus G means we use this uh, JS knowledge graph. How we use this knowledge graph is, um, so for each research paper, they are already attached to a, um, uh, to an ontology and it can also be linked with all other uh, research papers can be linked with um, other ontology. So it has more context meaning. For example, uh, if you use ChatGPT or other language models, nowadays people are typing like one short prompt and it can um, generate results for you. But if you input longer prompts, you put more context into it, then the results would be improved, right? Because you put more uh, information in it. The uh, search entropy means the model is less likely to be like, um, have the delusion or uh, misunderstood your meanings. So put with more JS context, put more with the hierarchical JS ontology, put more on the JS knowledge graph, the model should have uh, better performance because it has more information and related information. So actually the experiment shows the same thing. Uh, we have different matrices, the precision, NDCG, MAP, and MR are some evaluation matrix. Like the higher the number is better, means the uh, search system can give you uh, better relevant results. So with uh, BM25, it's the most traditional method to retrieve um, research, uh, search items. Um, 
WMD is word mover distance, NWT is neural word distance, and BERT is the language model. And you can see using this uh, knowledge graph, it can boost the uh, traditional methods a lot, like improve like almost 50% of the relevance of the results. And even with the most advanced model, I think Google used this model two years ago. Um, it already has very good results when uh, using those language models. And we even we can even pre, uh, increase this uh, advanced model a little bit with the knowledge graph because it puts more relevant information in it. So by doing those experiments, we show that just knowledge graph can improve the search results for um, paper, research paper retrieval task. And also here we have the uh, visualization. Uh, the visualization is, remember we have all the hierarchical ontology and here visualize all the uh, root, the bottoms of the knowledge areas. So we have the domain application, data management, all those uh, basic like um, big chapters of the JS knowledge. And then they also link to with their like finer granular definition and learning objectives, and they can forge such a knowledge graph. And you can um, rotate, you can zoom into a certain area, and you can find relevant uh, information by creating those nodes. And if you click on those nodes, the left side will also give you uh, research papers or Wikipedia pages that helps you understand what each of those uh, concepts are referring to and put more context or put more information to you so you can learn from there. So that is the system. Also, um, it also goes another way. So uh, the left side is also the interface for the uh, search system. You just see that before you can type in some keywords just to use you uh, just using, just like you use Google Scholar and other system. So it will have um, title and app chats retrieved to you. So this is how the system works. And that's the uh, JS notch graph. Hey, very neat. Thanks. Thanks. Great, thank you. Jason, I think um, Xinwei will moderate if there's any need for moderation for questions. Does, uh... So any, any questions for Jason? Well, of course I've got one. Um, <laughs> so Jason, when you say that um, uh, you tested it by using like BM25 uh, bag of words sort of search, I'm still a bit unclear. How did, how did you introduce the knowledge graph so when you say BM25 plus G, how exactly did you introduce the knowledge graph into that search? Yes. So um, there are two ways. Uh, so we have all the core, so in the BM25 raw research uh, search methods, we have your keywords and we have all the corpus. The corpus means all the research papers and the Wikipedia pages and the system just matching the words similarity between your keywords and all the uh, papers. Okay, so this is the raw method. All the methods are doing the same thing. You have the keywords, you have the uh, research papers. But with the plus G, it goes like this way. So uh, after you type the keywords, the plus G methods will first look for those um, hierarchical knowledge graphs. So for example, here I have the example with the WebGIS. So with the WebGIS goes into that, um, two ontology will be highlighted on the right side. I mean, one is WebGIS and I think one is online jazz. Uh, some other web, web uh, concepts will also be highlighted because they are hierarchical. And so uh, if you just search WebGIS, you can only get what like web and JS in like very traditional methods. But with this ontology, it will also link to you with the online JS service, uh, web map tool, and all the relevant concepts in this JS domain. So it has um, kind of 
expand the original search items. Uh, so this is the like overall structure by putting more uh, hierarchical ontology into this search uh, process. So then you just, instead of just feeding uh, the BM25 WebGIS, you feed it WebGIS and web map tools? Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I'll go. I'll, let me ask my question. Um, this is just fascinating, brilliant stuff. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to ask about um, like use user scenarios, so I can kind of see the one which is I'm a researcher and I'm doing that information retrieval use case that you talked about and searching for getting into a cluster of knowledge that is really cool. So that's kind of one thing that you could talk about. But the other one is um, an artificial intelligence application. Uh, and I'm sure you've thought about that and how, an, how um, you know, um, a smart machine would use this in, in for something. Do you want to speculate and talk about that a little bit? Yes. Yes, that's a good question and observation. Um, all the language models, they have hallucination. Uh, if you use ChatGPT, it will just give you sounding things, but it's not true or it does not exist as well. So uh, with those kind of knowledge graph or experts curated database, the um, language models can provide you with like uh, reference, can provide you with like solid reference, then you don't know it's true or it's more factual, like human analysis. So this is, I think this is the one a uh, huge application for this one. Uh, and also um, besides, so it, just the AI tool, and I think it is really easy to incorporate this to the, uh, you can have this as a plugin or just as prompt to the chat GPT. And the chat, I think chat GPT and other language models, GPT, BERT are trained with knowledge graphs. So meaning you can, so if you have a language sentence like, uh, I'm using WebGIS to create something. And uh, their free train process will replace WebGIS with web, web tool by looking at those knowledge graphs. So this, that's the company, how they train their language models. I think that's, so I think this really highlights the value of good data source. So those kind of knowledge graphs would be a valuable data source. Um, also, the UCGS has this um, GIS body of knowledge. And uh, they already, um, they have these topics and all those hierarchical structures. If you let me choose the uh, knowledge area, it will have so those uh, kind of hierarchical structure, like because we already have those uh, knowledge points identified and they can just put those in. And if there's no new articles, they will uh, link with, click on these concepts and it will link with those uh, different articles with references. So this is how the UCGS using this kind of stuff. It seems like maybe there's another, well, it, it, similar application there for the UCGIS. They've got their body of knowledge and it shows a couple of publications there. But if we could link this up kind of live with their website you could dynamically pull in you know references that match the topic area it seems like it'd be a lot a lot more powerful yes that's really a use case and we are actually looking for some user feedback how, how they think those such, such system would be Well, um, a little bit more. So those are in the appendix, not in the uh, first uh, research paper, but we also, you know, every um, research paper, if, especially for the spatial decision part, they will mention some like use case area and we can get those location name mentioned from the paper and we can count them like where you do your case study in. And here is the count for the uh, research papers. Yeah. 
and that was a challenging task, as I recall. You had some difficulties with, you know, when they list authors for a paper, right? It lists locations of authors. So were you able to filter those out separately? Because that's kind of different piece of information than where the, you know, if it has a spatial location like Lake Tahoe. Yes. Um, when we do this, we only have the, um, we only found the location mentioned in the title and abstracts. There are no author's location in this one. So this is kind of, <clears throat> this is how we derive the, what, what is the location I mean here? Only the uh, talk, the, uh, the places the paper talk about. You, you did some interesting work in merging different knowledge bases um, and how to merge them. Uh, are there, you know, so this is GIS body of knowledge. What, what, you know, can you just give me an example of a few other such knowledge bases like this where now we're not merging within, we're merging, you know, different uh, research areas or other areas outside of GIS? You know, what's what's that picture look like? Yeah, so um, remember in, the, in our project, there are many research teams, they are doing different body of knowledge, or they are doing different knowledge graphs. And I think they are all trying to merge uh, different knowledge graphs together. I think the most successful one actually come from my reading is come from the medical fields because they have different disease and they are merging medical and biological uh, knowledge graphs. Um, they are doing many progress. And I think there are some legal teams they are merging because they are creating knowledge graph from the legal documents and they are merging those. Uh, those are two use cases I've heard of. Thank you. And from what you've seen, are they also using language models to do, to automate some of the merging? Yes, yes. Um, so similar idea. Um, when we merge uh, different knowledge graphs, we have two things, only two scenarios. One is I already got your items. One is I don't have your item and we should merge them. So um, those uh, disambiguation, auto dis uh, disambiguation tools are trying to find overlaps or an, uh, identicals. And uh, then human need to have uh, inter uh, interfere with it and decide whether this is really overlap and how we should create a new one or just uh, keep those two separate things. Yes, you human have the final decision, and I know the medical fields are doing lots of the work because they hired lots of doctors to do that, and that is a very big project regarding the funding. Great. Well, thanks, Jason, and I, I think maybe now we can open it up for any more general questions.